yet, but uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Jo Macaro for, for joining us today. She actually just uh, traveled uh, continents away, so she's calling in from Lagos at the moment to uh, to help them with their uh, their electrophysiology and device program. So I really appreciate you taking the time because I know it's been a, a rough flight over, I'm sure. Um, so thank you very much. So today we'll be talking about uh, what it takes to start a CRT and ICD program. Uh, all you need to know, or at least all you need to know within the next 50 minutes, the rest uh, you may have to look up later. Um, just remember that everything that we have here is going to be posted on YouTube, so feel free to review it later, but we appreciate you all joining live. Um, please take the opportunity to engage since we're all on this call together, so raise your hand if you'd like to speak, reach out into the chat. Um, you know, this is all an interaction and we can all learn from each other, so looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much. So um, thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully you can hear me. If you don't, please um, let me know um, so that I can figure things out over here. I am call I'm calling in from Nigeria and so I have my setup, but it might be a little bit wonky. Um, so um, again, I'm going to be talking about ICDs and CRTs um, two weeks ago or so. We talked about pacemakers. So I hope this can be a little bit helpful. Um, and this will serve as, you know, kind of a um, companion to other um, presentations that we've had in the past. Um, so you can look at the YouTube channel. We've had a presentation on things that you need to know about ICD separately, as well as what you need to know about CRTs and programming. So this is a little bit more basic, but um, I hope that you can, um, you know, add this to your library. So um, I'm going to be talking about, you know, the different patients that we have and looking at it from a patient standpoint. All of these patients are very different and the way that you would approach these patients, of course, are different because the patients are different. Um, but if you consider, you know, a 76 year old woman, history of syncope, who might have an abnormal echo, right? Or if you have this 67 year old man with a heart failure and an abnormal EKG, or a 25 year old man with a history of heart disease as a child for which he has a pacemaker and with new shortness of breath, right? So all these patients, they need some device um, or they have a device that might need some more evaluation, um, but we definitely um, need to consider these patients differently. So what would you do? So I'm going to be talking about ICDs and CRTs, and I'm going to concentrate really on the patient selection. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, technical expertise, but um, please reach out um, through the chat or through the Q&A um, if you have specific questions. Um, also, special considerations and special populations um, as we need to talk about those. So um, two weeks ago, when we talked about pacemaker implantation, uh, we basically said, hey, when you're um, putting in a pacemaker, they're indicated for symptomatic bradycardia. And the things that you need to consider are your procedural areas, your procedural expertise, both on the, um, on the side of the interventional cardiologist or the invasive cardiologist or EP or the referring physician as well. And then you also have to think about your cath lab staff, right? The nurses, the techs, the physiologists, what do they need to know? Um, and looking um, definitely, of course, at the patients, which patients qualify for this technology, which patients don't. Well, what you have to consider for a defibrillator is pretty much the same thing, right? Apart from the symptomatic bradycardia part. So basically for um, defibrillators and CRTs, what you're pretty much looking at are indications for the both um, for the defibrillator. It's typically if you have ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation or sudden cardiac death. Um, and for CRT, it's pretty much um, heart failure or the risk for heart failure um, in somebody who um, has an abnormal EKG, either increased um, risk for pacing or if they have um, um, a left bundle branch block. The considerations for this are pretty much the same. And so what you would need to have is a well-trained staff and well-trained um, physicians. So I'm going to talk about patient A, who, you know, is our lady, if you remember, who had the um, abnormal, um, the syncopal episode. And, you know, as a little bit of a history, she had an abnormal echo. So, um, you know, you have this EKG and you can tell that this um, patient has 
um, this tachycardia, right? Um, it looks like it might be an atypical atrial flutter. And you kind of see these QRSs, these QRSs look a little bit wide, but borderline. But um, there are a few concerning things about the CKG. Number one, that QT interval looks really prolonged. And then there are these um, premature beats. And if you're not worried about this patient, you should be, um, because this is what the patient does, right, while they're in the hospital. So, you know, it's in the case of this patient where kind of they're shown to you with this presentation, they pretty much come wrapped in a bow. This is a patient who has, you know, sudden cardiac death or the syncope is as a result of cardiac syncope and they need to have a defibrillator. So let's take a little bit of, you know, a step back. So, you know, the history of the ICD, um, we should know it by now, just a little brief history, you know, um, so we have here Dr. Um, Murawski, who was the one that basically thought up the idea of the ICD. And he did it as a result of something that happened very similar to my patient, where his mentor what kept on having cardiac syncope and then once had one that nobody could get him out of. And so he thought to himself, well, what can I do to prevent this from happening? And that's how he came out with a prototype for the first ICD that was implanted um, in um, 1980. Well, since then, changed. And these are the modern generation um, of ICDs that we have for the three major companies. Biotronic um, pretty much went through the same transition. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at the recommendations for placement of a defibrillator, um, you know, one of the patients that um, it becomes very clear that you always very easy to determine whether the patient needs a defibrillator are the patients who have had VT or have had a witness arrest, or you can prove that they had ventricular fibrillation and they came back. Um, and, you know, you um, can place an ICD in those. So the, for those patients, it's pretty much a class one indication. Now, you know, these are from the um, United States guidelines or the American guidelines. Um, the ones from Europe are pretty much the same. Basically, for secondary prevention, with any patients with ischemic heart disease, if they have sudden cardiac arrest, so that is a patient who passes out, you do um, CPR, and you can kind of prove that they had um, a ventricular tachycardia either by looking at an AED read and seeing that they had a ventricular tachycardia, um, then you want to make sure, first of all, that the patient does not have ischemia that warrants revascularization. And if they don't, then you want to put in an ICD. For those patients who do end up having ischemia, then you revascularize and you kind of try to figure out, hey, is this patient um, high risk or not? For most of these patients, we, we put on a wearable defibrillator which is one that is external. You wait for three months and you kind of see what's going on for those patients. For the patients who have cardiac syncope, um, especially if they have an ejection fraction that's less than 35%, um, it is still a class one indication for you to put in an ICD. But then sometimes you want to see, hey, is this something that's, um, you know, um, is this something that um, is due to VT or not, particularly if they have an ejection fraction that's greater than 35%. So for those patients, is a class two indication to put do an EP study to see if they have inducible ventricular arrhythmias. And if they do, you want to put in an ICD. If they don't, then you might want to do extended monitoring, maybe with an implantable loop recorder. I can tell you that's very disconcerting to me, just because, you know, if they have an event, then you're a little bit concerned. So for cardiac syncope, you know, the patients typically will have syncope, but they come out of it. And so it is, you know, um, they resolve themselves versus somebody who has a cardiac arrest. So if the patient has a cardiac arrest, you know you did CPR, that patient gets an ICD, no harm, no foul. If they have cardiac syncope, which means that they pass out and then they wake up, then you're not really sure whether it's because of a ventricular arrhythmia or not. So if you can prove that either by EKG or worse some EKG, oh, they had a long QT interval, they have hokum, you know, they have um, an arrhythmogenic um, right ventricular um, dys dysplasia, if they have some substrate that will cause them to have VT, then it's more likely that you can put in an ICD first. And if not, then the EP study is warranted. 
Um, how about patients um, with ischemic heart disease um, that have not had ventricular tachycardia? Well, if they haven't, if they do get either revascularization um, or they had an MI that was um, more than 40 days ago or revascularization that's more than 90 days ago, then you want to give them medication and see if the ejection fraction improves. And if it doesn't, then they put in an ICD. Now, if it's less than any one of these, right, um, then you might want to do an EP study, especially if you see something that's a little bit concerning. Um, so for those patients, if they have like non-sustained VT, and this is remote from revascularization or re a little bit remote from the MI, usually we say greater than a week, then um, you want to do an EP study. If they have inducible VT, then you want to place an ICD and that's a class one. But really what you want to do is go guideline directed medical therapy, and then you want to put a wearable um, defibrillator, as we mentioned previously. For patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, as you can see, if they have had sudden cardiac arrest and they're an ICD candidate, you just put in the ICD. If they're not an ICD candidate, for whatever reason, life, um, life um, span that's going to be less than a year, they have, um, you know, um, dementia, or if they have, um, you know, delirium, then you might want to give them medical really certain, then you might want to do an e, um, EP study, but most of these pretty much end up with you putting in an ICD. Um, the only time that you don't is um, if the patient, um, they have an EF that's um, less than 35%, but maybe they haven't been treated for, um, you know, um, for their heart failure. So they have less than three months of guideline-directed medical therapy. Then you might want to do a um, wearable and reassess in three months. And actually, you know, I typically only do that for patients who have a concerning finding. So if they have PVCs, if they have an NYHA class of three and above, then those are patients who are more likely to need an ICD. And so I'd want to put on a wearable. But those patients who don't have any of that, so basically the only reason why I know that they have an ejection fraction that's low is because I just happened to do an echocardiogram, right? They didn't have any symptoms. They didn't have, you know, maybe they mentioned that they might be tired a little bit, but they didn't have anything. Or, you know, sometimes here they come into the emergency room and they breathe funny and somebody throws on an echo probe and you find out that this person has, you know, um, you know, a low ejection fraction. Well, what they might need might just be guideline directed medical therapy, making sure that their blood pressure is controlled. You might actually not need to put a wearable on. And actually most papers now have said, instead of waiting just three months, you should actually wait up to six months and sometimes even up to nine months before putting in an ICD. So um, those are considerations that you have to think about. So in summary, your class one indications are VTVF survivors. If they've had sudden cardiac arrest, um, they should get an ICD. If they have sustained ventricular tachycardia with structural heart disease or syncope and e um, VT or VF during EP study, they should get an ICD. Other class one indications, if they have NYHA two to three an ejection fraction less than 35% or NYHA one, post MI EF less than 30% or non-sustained VT post MI EF less than 40% and VTVF and EP study. But those, all those patients, class one indication for um, bullet point number four, um, of course, you have to have given them guideline directed medical therapy before we start considering putting um, in an ICD. Now for class 2A, which is basically similar um, to a class one, it just says, hey, you are supported if you decide to put in an ICD. Anybody has syncope, LV dysfunction, sustained VT, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then all the other, um, you know, cardiac um, etiologies of VT come under this. Of course, if they have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if they have Bugatta syndrome, they have to have other um, syncope or ventricular tachycardia or other risk factors that put you um, at risk for VT before considering an ICD. So just the diagnosis is not enough. This is unlike sarcoid, giant cell myocarditis, or Chagas disease, where the diagnosis is enough um, for you to put in an ICD in those patients. And then to B, these are ones where you would not be um, 
found wanting if you decided to put in an ICD, LV non-compaction, um, and YHA class one and EF less than 35% for some patients, um, long QT um, with sudden cardiac death risk factors, um, and familial cardiomyopathy. And then of course, do not put in an ICD if you suspect that the patient will have a survival of less than one year from some other cause. If they have incessant VT or VF, this is a patient who the device, you know, will not help the patient if the patient is only getting an ICD placed um, for secondary prevention or even if it's primary prevention with a narrow QRS. It's not going to help the patient if they have incessant VTVF and it actually might make them quite miserable. Remember, you're not sedating the patients before it shocks them, right? So sometimes patients will say that, oh, I've been shocked 30 times, 40 times. For those patients, you know, if you consider that you cannot help them with their underlying disease, then it might be cruel for you to put in an ICD. Now, patients who have significant psychiatric illness, you really don't want to put in an ICD because you don't know if they'll turn against the ICD. Um, patients who are class four without transplant or CRT indication. Um, and then if you have VT or VF with a reversible cause, please do not put in an ICD. Um, one consideration that you should think about when we're implanting the device, there's sometimes that we test the device during implantation. We don't do this anymore because of the simple trial, um, where they found out that when they tested for defibrillation, um, it was non-inferior to no defibrillation um, therapy um, during the procedure. So that is um, something definitely to think about. And I don't think there are a lot of people who do it now. I only do that if the patient either has a right-sided device or if the patient has a really huge heart, and I want to consider, you know, there's sometimes where your defibrillator actually will not work because the heart is so big. And so you have to consider putting in other things that might actually help the defibrillator become more effective. Um, but it's very rare that it's happened um, in my years of doing this. I've only had to do that one time. Um, but um, those are the considerations that I think about when I think about defibrillation testing during um, implantation. So the different kinds of devices that we can place, um, we've mentioned CRT, but basically you have your classic transvenous um, you know, um, defibrillator where you know that this is a defibrillator because um, the coil is there, right? Um, so in this particular defibrillator, you have a dual coil where one coil is in the SVC and the other is in the RV. We try not to, I personally try not to put in a dual coil just because the devices have become so good now that we don't necessarily have to have that dispersion of energy to have a successful shock. But the second thing also is that um, it becomes very difficult to take out if for any reason you have to take it out due to infection. So I don't typically do that, but this is what a classic ICD would look like. So this has three leads. Sometimes you just have two leads, one in the A, one in the V. Sometimes you just have one lead, one in the V. Um, and um, there are different indications for um, all of those. Of course, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but I know that, you know, folks are traveling abroad and coming back with devices that you might not be used to seeing. So one of them is the subcutaneous ICD. So this is an ICD that's actually extra thoracic. So what that means is the lead and the device are actually underneath the skin, but over the rib cage. So because of that, it's a bigger device the shock that it sends through, unlike 40 joules from the internal device, this can actually go up to 85 joules, um, and it has no pacing capabilities. It can temporarily pace post-shock, but it cannot you know, painlessly pace you out of any arrhythmia. So that is a consideration to think about. Why would we put in an SICD? Um, well, that would be for patients who are younger. I typically like to do that for. So if they have sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, don't really have a reason for them to, um, don't have any scar, don't have any pacing indication, then I would put in a sub QICD. And why would you do that? Well, because of a few things. Number one, you save the vessels for anything else they might need in the future. Um, and then also this doesn't have a weight limitation. So when you put in a regular defibrillator, you always have to counsel the patients about weight. So you can't lift weights heavier than 35 pounds in the affected arm. Um, 
um, some younger patients become a little bit distressed by that because, you know, they can't weight lift, they can't exercise as well, much as they want to. Um, and sometimes, you know, even for your job, you can't lift anything heavy. And so that could be a consideration. The other thing that you could think about is um, for patients who have renal disease or patients who have diabetes and they're at higher risk for infection, this is an ICD that um, would help with that because again, you don't have that intravascular component. And if this gets infected, the worst thing that you'll have is a skin infection. It doesn't actually go to the heart. So um, those are the two considerations that I um, look at. Now, um, Medtronic, so the other um, device that I talked to you about, the SICD, is actually a Boston device. Only Boston makes this. Um, the um, other device that has just come out newly FDA approved in the United States is the EV ICD, which is the S extravascular ICD um, made by Medtronic. As you can see, the can is actually pretty small. It's pretty similar to what the, um, the generator size looks like for your classic device. But this lead is actually underneath the sternum. So it's over, it's in the kind of, it's outside the pericardium, but underneath the sternum. And so it doesn't need as much energy as the SICD needs. And then it has this coil. It definitely can do some pacing. So you can do actually, um, you can actually um, pace the patient out of um, some arrhythmias, but you can't just pace the patient on a regular basis. So this is somebody who um, has all those indications that I talked about, but maybe in addition to that, you think this patient might benefit from anti-tachycardia pacing, which is pacing that we do when we detect a monomorphic VT um, to get them out of it before you give them the big shock. And so that's more painless VT therapy. So um, other considerations, right, um, when we consider pacing um, placement of an ICD from the technical standpoint for your rooms, you can start off with, you know, an OR room using a C-arm. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a cath lab, even though if you do have a cath lab, that's like, you know, the Mercedes Benz of it all. If you can have a cath lab, that would be the best because it does give you a few more options for things that you can do. But if you want to start out a device program, then an OR room with a C-arm is perfect, right? As long as you have a bed that the C-arm can look through, you have a table to set things up, um, your external defibrillator, um, just because while you're placing the device, remember, you could put the paper into VT. So you want to have pads on the patient, um, or at least the ability to shock the patient if you need to. You have to have continuous telemetry. And remember, these are sick patients. And so you need to monitor them throughout the, um, you know, throughout the procedure. Um, you definitely want to give antibiotics. So antibiotics are given within two hours of the initial cut to reduce the risk of infection. Your anesthesia is helpful. I typically give moderate sedation for a simple ICD, but if I were doing a subcutaneous ICD, an SICD, where you tunnel through the skin, tunnel through the tissue, you definitely want to do general anesthesia. Um, but you know, if you use, I don't know, there are different practice styles. If you use general anesthesia most of the time, that's also, you know, um, you can definitely do that. Um, you want protective lead shielding for yourself, right? Because you're going to be placing the device with use of fluoride with the C-arm. Definitely want sutures, sterile drapes, and C-arm cover, and basically all the tools that go along with placement of a device. Now, don't forget your programmer and your wands. You want a PSA cable adapter, um, and then you want all these leads and everything else. All right? I I'd mentioned this is what the table typically looks like. Um, for me. Um, and if you can get your table looking like this, then you're halfway um, through the game. Now, for programming, there are many different um, programming um, choices that you have, or many different device choices that you have. Um, the most popular one in Nigeria, at least for sure, and actually I think in um, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, is Medtronic. They have a huge presence. Um, but of course, remember that we have patients who are traveling abroad, and so they might get devices that are not only Medtronic. So you definitely do have to ask the patient, hey, what kind of device do you have? Um, because you need to have a programmer so that you can 
um, check that device. Now, if they don't have, if you do not have the programmer and the patient is doing things that you don't really know of, then please reach out to us so that we can figure out exactly um, what happens um, or how we can get the patient checked. We're in the process of gathering all that information um, in a database so that we'll know where um, folks have different programmers so that you can at least direct the patients there. Because, and why would you care? Well, because there's sometimes, you know, this is not just the pacemaker, even though a pacemaker is a life-saving therapy, sometimes the defibrillator can act in ways that you don't necessarily understand. For instance, it might start shocking the patient and you don't know whether it's appropriate or not inappropriate, especially if, you know, the patient comes to you and says, hey, I've been shocked. And they're not being, they're not actively in ventricular tachycardia. They're not actively in an arrhythmia when they come to see you. A shock should always be taken seriously. For me, I tell my patients, and actually recommendations are, that if you have a patient who has been shocked once, then you tell them to come to the next um, available clinic visit, usually within the next 24 hours. If they've been shocked more than once, then they actually should come to the hospital and get evaluated because once they get shocked more than three times, that's three VT episodes in a 24-hour period, they're considered to be in VT storm. And this is something that needs to be evaluated in the hospital. So immediately when they come in, they should be put in ICU. You should have um, telemetry on and basically see what it is that's causing the shock. When you interrogate the device with any one of these programmers, it should be able to tell you what's going on. So if either the patient is has an appropriate shock, which means the patient has VT or VF, um, and they got shocked out of it, in which case you need to give them medications to help them, or they have an inappropriate shock. What could cause an inappropriate shock? Number one culprit, atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation that goes really fast can cause an inappropriate shock. Why is it inappropriate? Well, because atrial fibrillation, even when going fast, is not going to cause you to be unconscious. Um, it's not going to cause you to not have that, um, that reduced consciousness that you need so that you don't get PTSD from getting a device shock. Um, and, you know, also because you don't know how long the atrial fibrillation has been there. And so if they haven't been on anticoagulation, then um, they might actually um, end up having a stroke as a result of a blood clot because they were shocked. So those are that's one way and uh, one thing that can cause an inappropriate shock. The other thing that can cause an inappropriate shock is basically a lead dislodgement, right? So if you have a lead that's placed and it is kind of moving in between the atrium and the ventricle, depending on how you programmed, it might actually be, you know, at a point where it thinks that the patient is in VT and the patient is not. Sometimes you can have lead malfunction. So either the um, lead is fractured or um, something's wrong with it, where it's seeing things that are not necessary necessarily there. And so it starts shocking the patient because it thinks that the patient is in VT or VF and the patient is not. So all of these things really require, once the patient has been shocked, the patient needs to get evaluated, the patient needs to see a cardiologist who knows how to interpret this um, and um, knows what to do to treat. Now, um, for programming, we typically like to program, um, or sorry, to follow up the patient. We typically like to follow up the patient's every three months. So, you know, if the patients at least, if they have an ICD, at least every six months, they should be coming by so that they can get checked. So that you can just make sure, hey, they didn't have any events. They didn't have any atrial arrhythmias that you might be concerned about. But those who have like a single chamber or a dual chamber, you don't want them to be pacing that much. And because depending on the indication, they might actually need an upgrade. And then sometimes you can also check heart failure management. Um, so um, the devices are typically able to detect thoracic impedance, which basically measures how much fluid you have in the chest cavity. And it's actually able to proceed um, patient symptoms by telling you, oh, this patient has fluid and this patient might need to get diuresed to get optimized for their heart failure. So integrate interrogations, especially regular interrogations, are really important um, in these patients. So um, now the elephant in the room is that heart failure treatment is definitely very different from yesterday than from today. And so this brings us to our second patients um, where, um, you know, we have indications for CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy. Now, before I get um, going, I just wanted to see if there's any questions um, prior to me moving um, on to um, 
Oh yeah, somebody says, is there a nominal for thoracic impedance? Yes, but that really depends on the device. And so each device company will have um, a measure of what is normal for them. Um, and, and also remember, because your thoracic impedance really depends on specific things, right? It depends on, you know, the lead, depends on the device. Um, and then it also depends on the width of the patient, whether the patient has like, um, for instance, they have lung disease, they're going to have a higher thoracic impedance than not, than not. And so all of those things kind of come together to give you a nominal, um, but it differs per patient, per device. And so what we typically look at is the thoracic thread trends, um, the tr thoracic impedance trends on the programming. And then when we see, then we make changes as a result of that. And, and to add to that, a lot of times Any, it's actually a suggestion uh, mm -hmm. not to turn on thoracic impedance for the first 30 days of implant um, because you know the device has to get a baseline for that specific patient. And then it kind of caters the thoracic impedance to that. So if you do turn it on at, at implant and you see a thoracic impedance that's way out of range in the first three months or so, I wouldn't stress about it. That device is just kind of learning the new nominal for that patient, and then it will adjust. Same thing with reprocessed devices. You know, it's going to be using old data to apply to a new patient, and it has to have time to kind of collect new data. Thank you. So here we have the 67-year-old abnormal NKG, already known heart failure, and the patient is referred to you, right? And so when you look at this EKG, you should be able to see this patient is in sinus bradycardia, um, but they have this wide QRS and they have this slurring in or this notched QRS in one and AVL um, and this terminal slurring, this patient has a left bundle branch block. So this patient would be prime for um, cardiac resynchronization therapy, right? So if the patient has an ejection fraction that's less than 35%, then this patient um, will need um, a CRTD, right? And that would be um, a class one indication for that patient if they have an NYHA class of two and above. Um, but how about this patient, right? Who's a little bit younger, 25 years old, but he's been pacing for such a long time and he's coming in with new shortness of breath. And let's say you do an echocardiogram, they've had echoes in the past, the EF has been normal, but now the ejection fraction is lower. Well, they might actually have pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy, in which case they also need um, placement of a cardiac res resynchronization therapy. So an upgrade of their present device to one that is able to... Um, um, cause um, cardiac resynchronization. So, um, you know, as mentioned, basically um, CRT is an opportunity to improve heart failure outcomes. And, you know, in patients who have been shown to have um, an increased risk for um, heart failure as a result of increased pacing, cardiac resynchronization therapy has been shown to be helpful. Um, a lot of um, what I will talk to you about moving forward will come from the Heart Rhythm Society um, guidelines on cardiac physiologic pacing um, for the um, avoidance and mitigation of heart failure. And they describe cardiac physiologic pacing as being pacing that um, really mimics what you see regularly in the heart. So that includes um, both um, CRT, which is your cardiac resynchronization therapy, which basically means that you have a lead in the RV, but you also have a lead in the CS going into a ventricular branch that is typically in the lateral wall. And then the second um, would be um, page, um, patients who have his bundle pacing. Um, I don't know if um, any of you have heard of that. It was all the rage a few years ago. Now less so just because of some technical issues that people discovered. But then the new rage is left bundle branch pacing, which we'll discuss a little bit um, moving forward. So who would you put these patients um, or which patients would you put this in? Well, any patients who um, have a left bundle branch block, right? And if they have, um, they don't have like indications for pacing, but they have a left bundle branch block, um, these are the typical patients that you'll be looking at. If they have an EF that's less than 30%, they would need CRT with IV pacing if they are NYHA 1, right? If they're NYHA 2 to 4, EF less than 35% now, then your QRS 120 to 149 is okay to give you CRT with bifid pacing 
if the QRS is greater than 150, then, you know, same thing, CRT with by pacing, you don't necessarily have to look at, at other risk factors. Um, they will still be, you know, or they would still benefit from CRT. Um, but if you cannot put in that left bundle lead, either because you did, don't have targets or the patient has really difficult anatomy, then you can put in a second lead with left bundle or his bundle pacing. Um, you might hear people talk about hot CRT or lot CRT, where basically you're putting in a left bundle or you're putting a his bundle with your regular RV pacing. And that actually has been shown to be of benefit. The um, um, the the um, information that we have or the data that we have is not quite as robust as CRT, and we definitely don't have longitudinal data. So take all of this with kind of, you know, that grain of salt, and I think that's the reason why it's a class 2A indication. Now, for patients who have an ejection fraction that's 36 to 50 percent, we do have a study called Block HF, which basically says, hey, if these patients either, um, if they have a high degree of pacing, um, then they should be getting by the um, ICD, um, a by V pacemaker, at least if they have an ejection fraction of 36 to 50 percent. If they have an ejection fraction of less than 35 percent, then, of course, they should be getting um, CRT. Now, this becomes important, right? In a patient, for instance, who shows up, has a um, pacing indication, has, um, you know, you know that you're going to pace this patient more than 20% of the time, and the patient has a low ejection fraction. For that particular patient, they already have an indication for um, pacing, so you know you're going to put it in a device. Previously, what we used to do was put in the device, and you know, hope that they get better. And if they don't get better, then in three months, we would upgrade that device from a pacemaker to a defibrillator. Well, that increases your risk for infection, increases your risk for bloodborne diseases, and all these things that you know typically come with replacement um, of a device. And so actually those folks in, um, it's recommended that if you know that this patient has a pacing indication or has some other reason why they would be getting a device, then just go ahead, if they already meet criteria for the device placement, just go ahead and put in an ICD. So a CRTD can be put in a patient who has a pacing indication for heart block, for instance, and has less than that 90 days of um, waiting or therapy that um, you would need previously, or for somebody who has an MI, but has a pacing indication, an ejection fraction that's less than um, 35%, you don't necessarily have to wait for the patient to, for the um, 40 days after MI or um, 90 days after intervention before putting in an ICD, you can go ahead and just go straight with a CRTD. And then, of course, if the patients, um, you cannot achieve CRT, that's when you go for his bundle or left bundle pacing. Now, with patients, like I said, with indications for pacing, um, if they are at time of cardiac surgery, then you want to put in an LV um, epicardial lead placement. Um, there are those who would argue that this is definitely not as good as, or at least the EPs would argue that it's, def it's not as good as putting in um, CRT, but sometimes, um, or an internal, um, what is it called, an internal lead, but sometimes, you know, um, you can't really help it. Um, other things are, if the patient um, does not have um, substantial ventricular pacing needs, then, and has an ejection fraction that's greater than 35%, then actually you might be able to just put in your regular pacing lead with minimization of RV pacing, um, by the protocols that we typically have in the device. And you know that's a little bit out of the scope of this talk, but there are definitely ways that we can basically program the device so that the device doesn't ventricularly pace as much. But if you consider, if you say, hey, these patients are going to need it, then um, you definitely wanna do it. Um, other things to mention. You know, whenever I look at these diagrams, the things that I typically look for, I look for the green, which are the class one indications, and then I look for the red, which are the class three indications. Everything else like the um, oranges and the yellows are okay to know, but those ones, the green and the red, you really do want to know those like the back of your hand. In this particular case, the patients who CRT with by pacing has shown no benefit are those who have an ejection fraction of greater than 50% 
and they're not going to have substantial uh, ventricular pacing. And actually, you know, patients with an ejection fraction of greater than um, 50% who do have substantial pacing, you know, you can put in an ICD, but that's a class 2B, and most people will not, um, but it's definitely contraindicated for those who do not have a high degree of pacing, for sure. So where would you put it? Well, you know, we've gone through this before. Um, studies have shown that it is best if you put your um, CRT lead in the posterior lateral or the basal part of the heart, and then you also want to be putting it in the lateral or posterior lateral, even though if you go anterior lateral, because that's the only branch you have, you know, then that's the way that the cookie crumbles. But where it does not help is if you do this um, in the um, anterior side. So in the AIV, in anywhere that's really close so basically what I mentioned was if you're, um, you know, you want to be mostly in this green part, you don't want to be in the red parts. The posterior, like here, anywhere that's really septal, really close to um, the RV lead, it's not going to help you for CRT purposes. You want to be as lateral as you can and as basal as you can, because that's where you consider that that is the most delayed part of the um, heart. And that's what you're trying to bring in. All right. Okay. So when you're putting in CRT, you would think to yourself, well, CRT is not that different from a regular ICD. There's just one big other um, vein that you have to put a lead in. It shouldn't be that um, um, problematic. Actually, no, it does take a little bit of skill. And the thing about the C-arm is that the resolution is really not that great. Remember, your heart is moving as well. So when you're putting in an RV lead where you have this huge ventricle, the heart having a little bit of a delay in movement that you can see is actually not that big of a deal. But when you're putting in a CS lead, where you're actually trying to put it into a vein, you're trying to cannulate a vein, then putting in, um, using a C-arm is actually not helpful and it could actually cause harm. So you do want to make sure that you have a fluoroscopy suite with a fluoroscopy C-arm because the resolution is higher, it's faster, um, you're able to zoom in if you need to. Um, it does have all of these things that um, are necessary for you to have to make your, um, to make your um, procedure a success. Um, of course, the other things that go along with putting in the ICD pretty much stay the same. Um, you definitely want your light source, if source, if you can put in an electrocautery, that would be great um, just to help control bleeding. Um, but everything else is pretty much the same as you would um, put in um, for a regular um, ICD or a pacemaker. Um, but here, the fluoroscopy suite really is a non-negotiable. Now, what would you use for your CRT? There's so many leads that you can um, you have, right? So you have different shapes of quad pole leads where all of these little black dots here are poles. It gives you so many options. Um, um, that was Abbott. This was Medtronic. Um, Boston does the same thing. Um, and so really, you know, you could also have bipolar leads where you have two um, um, electrodes, you have quad pole leads, which are my favorite. It gives you so many options. And then sometimes you have just a really tiny lead and it's unipolar. Um, it only allows you one configuration, which is the distal LV lead, um, LV to the RV coil. So you really want a little bit more of an option. Um, compared to that one, you have this quad pole, which on Abbott will give you 10 vectors. On Medtronic, it can give you up to 14 vectors. Um, and so, you know, you have so many options to program against um, that it can actually help. And then actually with the Abbott device, um, there's this um, thing called multi-point pacing where you're able to actually look at the entire um, um, the entire lateral wall where you have this um, these electrodes. And if you have a small enough threshold, which is basically the amount of energy that's needed to capture the ventricular tissue, you can actually uh, pull in the entire um, wall with that single beat. And it has shown non-inferiority to regular um, bi biventricular pacing. Um, they didn't power it enough for superiority, so we can't really talk about that. 
Now, going to left bundle area pacing for cardiac resynchronization therapy, as I mentioned, you know, previously we were doing his bundle pacing where we were trying to um, go through the septum and hit the his bundle. The issues with that and why we kind of stayed away from that now, not necessarily stayed away, but we have kind of shifted or pivoted is because for the his bundle, when you have a good signal, you have a great signal. But sometimes over time, you are seeing thresholds suddenly increase. Um, again, you if you consider it, right, the body is um, meant to protect itself. And so what does it do? If it sees something that is intruding in the conduction system, it fibrosis, right? And so when you fibrose the tip of the lead, all of a sudden your threshold goes up. And sometimes even with the energy that you have, you're not able to capture um, that area. And since a lot of times you are actually very proximal in the um, septum, sometimes you are actually in the atrial septum capturing the um, his bundle. So even the tissue wasn't able to help you. Unlike left bundle pacing, so with left bundle area pacing, what you're doing is going down below um, the his and trying to infiltrate the left bundle. And when you do that, best case scenario, you, inter um, you um, intersect into the um, into the conduction system. Worst case scenario, you're just in the septum, which is still better than being in the RV apex. And so, you know, this um, paper was written in 2021, just basically looking at, you know, the changes in cardiac variables. What they found was that, you know, your QRS duration was down with left bundle. Your um, New York um, functional um, heart class actually improved with left bundle. Um, and then also your ejection fraction actually in some cases increased with left bundle and um, your end diastolic diameter decreased with left bundle. So all of these things that we look at when we're looking at cardiac resynchronization therapy, classic cardiac resynchronization therapy, they were actually seen in left bundle pacing. And so that's the reason why folks are continuing to do it more and more. Now, um, so for pacing strategies for uh, patients undergoing, um, you know, pacemaker implantation for bradycardia, you know, remember what I said, the green and the red. Um, you definitely don't want to do CRT with by the pacing in patients who have an ejection fraction that's greater than 50%. Um, for pacing strategies in patients without bradycardia who have heart failure, for those patients who have um, pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy with a high burden of right ventricular pacing, um, which is considered to be greater than um, 20%, you want to place um, CRT. Um, in those patients who have left bundle QRS that's greater than 150% and MYHA class 2 to 5, those patients are definitely class 1 indication for CRT with bi -V pacing. And then if CRT cannot be achieved, then you can do a his bundle. Um, also, if you have left bundle with a QRS of 120 to um, 150 and an MYHA class that is class two to four, um, those patients also um, would um, need um, a BIV as well. And if they have select characteristics, for instance, if they're female, um, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now, for those patients who have a QRS that's less than 120, then you do not want to put in CRT um, because that will show no benefit. For patients who have a QRS of 120 to 149, and this is important, they have an ejection fraction of less than 35%. QRS is 120 to 149, but they're not left bundle. And they have an NYHA class of one to two. What does that mean? That they have less exertion or less exertion mediated shortness of breath, less exertion um, associated um, dyspnea, then you do not want to put in CRT for those patients. And it's kind of tempting, right? Because you see something that looks like it could get better, but really you would be better um, served by just kind of watching the patient. And then if the patient starts to deteriorate, then you can put in CRT with bi pacing um, or um, his bundle pacing. Now, we haven't gotten to the point where we can do his bundle pacing with an ICD lead. There are two considerations for that. Number one, you have to have a really stable lead that's able to um, undergo the kind of shifts that the septum does. The septum does move a little bit more. You have a fulcrum point that um, is not accounted for in present um, 
you know, presently um, use leads. So that's number one. The second thing you also have to think about is that the positioning of the RV lead where you put in the coil actually helps with your defibrillation if you need it. So you want to cover as much of the left ventricle as possible, really as much of the ventricle as possible. So if you're placing a lead in the his um in the um, left bundle position or the his position, that doesn't give you enough of the left bundle of the left ventricle to cover or any of the ventricle really for this device that's in your shoulder to actually shock the patient. So those are the two reasons why we do not do at this point left um, bundle area um, implantation of ICD leads. So you do want to be a little bit more apical septum really for placement of those. Now, for patients with um, atrial fibrillation, um, you first of all have to decide, are you going to do an AV node um, ablation or not? Um, some people might say, well, we don't do AV node ablations in Nigeria. Are you talking about this? Well, we actually have an EP lab at the Lagos State um, University Teaching Hospital. So if your patients come up, can come up there to get evaluated, um, I'll be there for the next week. So please definitely reach out um, and let me know if you need your patients to be seen. Um, and we'll be doing an EP um We'll be doing an EP um, mission um, in September. So we're kind of evaluating patients now for that mission. Um, also, um, you know, so you want to kind of see, hey, does this patient meet criteria for an AV um, node um, ablation? And what does that mean? Well, the patient has really bad heart failure. Um, it's not amenable to regular therapy. And actually, um, we've done a couple of studies that have shown that atrial fibrillation itself, whether rate controlled or not rate controlled, if you're not able to get the patient out of AFib, then putting in, doing an AV node ablation and actually putting in a BIV will actually improve the ejection fraction a little bit more than not. So for those patients who meet, um, you know, CRT criteria, they should definitely be getting a CRT. If they don't meet CRT criteria, let's say their ejection fraction is greater than 50%, then those patients can actually get his bundle pacing or, you know, left bundle pacing um, without having um, a CRT. So um, the other thing about management, right? So for patient follow-up, there are other considerations when you have conduction system pacing um, or physiologic pacing um, to consider, right? The first thing is you want to see if the ejection fraction improves, right? Because that does definitely help us with outcomes. And that's one of the measures that you're looking at when you're putting in a CRT. The second thing that you want to do is just make sure that your CRT or your um, physiologic pacing is being affected. So certain things can happen over the first three months of placing a device, a lead can move, you know, even if you screw it in, you think you screwed it in enough into the left bundle area, it's not capturing enough, you have to, you know, change your programming a little bit, you know, all of those things mean that you definitely have to see the patient very um, often. Um, they have here remote monitoring, we don't have that right now in Sub-Saharan Africa, at least I don't think so. If I'm mistaken, please um, let me know in the chat. But, um, what I tell my patients is either I'm seeing you in clinic every three months, and for those with physiologic pacing, that's basically what I do every three months, I'm seeing them, or, um, you know, they have a remote monitor. Um, for the pacemakers, you know, I usually go six months to a year, but for the defibrillators, it's going to be every six months. And for those patients who have physiologic pacing, I really want to see them every three months. Of course, I understand um, that, you know, in certain cases, you know, travel might be a problem. And so I encourage them to do that as much as possible. But um, if you find that your patient is not really responding the way that you want them to, then you might need to change your strategy, you might need to open up, you know, the patient's pocket, replace the device. We try not to do that, but that is one of the things that um, you, um, you know, we typically want to do. And now, uh, with the generator change, you know, for certain patients, if they have had an improved ejection fraction, there's some people who are like, well, can I just get rid of the CRT and just continue with the dual chamber pacer since, you know, they've improved or change it, just cap all the leads and just change it to a um, regular ICD. Please do not do that uh, because the CRT is heart failure therapy. And so what you want to do is keep them on their heart failure therapy because that is what's working. It's similar to you saying, oh, I'm going to take the patient off a of beta blocker because their heart failure got better. That's definitely not something that we do. 
So other thing is, you know, remember I said that these devices are capable of um, looking at the thoracic impedance. Um, basically, what they have mentioned is, look, the thoracic impedance is definitely a measure, but it's not something that you should only do and say, hey, this patient has a high thoracic impedance um, or sorry, a low thoracic impedance. So therefore, we need to, um, you know, change their medications. No, you need to talk to the patient. You need to, you know, make sure their symptoms are correlating with what the device sees. Um, because sometimes definitely it's not as optimal as it could be. There are other devices that are a little bit better in that. This is a good surrogate, but you definitely have to talk to the patient, have to figure out what's going on um, with the patient before, um, you know, using just the thoracic impedance measurement. And that is all I have. I hope that I've kind of gone through enough of this that you'll kind of know um, how to set things up. Pretty much we went through the technical parts of things. Um, first of all, you know, I really concentrated on how you would recognize the patients that need um, CRT, how you recognize the patients that need an ICD, um, what you would do for those patients, um, and the technical um, things that we would need. Um, we've definitely um, talked about that. Um, it, none of this, of course, is possible if you do not have well-trained, um, you know, implanters, well-trained um, diagnostic physicians who are able to see what's going on and um, refer the patients appropriately. And of course, you know, diagnostic tools like EKG, um, echocardiogram, so that you're able to detect the patients um, who would actually benefit from this life-saving therapy. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and um, if you have any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. That was amazing. I'm going to go ahead and share my own screen here as I fight with my app. Uh, just if you do have any questions, just chime in um, into the chat and it will be all visualized here so that we can all see what's going on. Um, but you know, I think that was really, really helpful. Uh, Dr. Joma really walked us through like what, what's needed. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to hear if there's anyone in the crowd that has any thoughts on this at all. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate everyone's uh, involvement here tonight. We had a, had a great crowd. And like I said, we will be posting this on YouTube. But if you do have any questions for what we discussed today, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for, for your engagement. And we will be obviously uh, looking to support your programs moving forward. So if there's specific things that you'd like to, uh, to work on to cover, just let us know and we're happy to go over it. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you. Take Have care. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye. Oh, someone said, okay, discussion. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Perfect. we can. We're working towards it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You all take care. Thank you so much.